Currently, um, we're going to now be moving into discussing and looking into how gender is integrated into the voluntary carbon market. Um, and this is going to be building off Leticia's um, presentation. And hopefully, we will hopefully connect some dots in that regard. Um, that said, I do want to make just a few disclaimers about this presentation. Um, as you've noticed um, from Leticia's presentation, the VCM ecosystem is very large and very complex um, with different governance, institutional frameworks and standards, buyers and sellers, and different financial and finance intermediaries. So for the purposes of this presentation and given some of the time constraints that um, we have, and um, this is not a three-day workshop, only a two-hour uh, event, um, I'm going to be just focusing on some, on some key areas that we can discuss. Um, but again, if there's any more discussion or people want to talk about a specific item in a bit more detail, we have different avenues that we now can do this post this event. Um, another key thing I would like to highlight is that the information, much of the information that's in my presentation um, is thanks to a very informative and um, detailed analysis that was done actually by two colleagues that are with us here today, uh, Sue Phillips and Olivia Jenkins. And that was a report that was done through the ASEAN Low Carbon Energy Program. And the report's called Integrating a Gender Lens into the Voluntary Carbon Market. And maybe perhaps, Amanda, would you be able to share a link to the report in the chat box? And then also we will be sharing this presentation um, as long, uh, along with Leticia's presentation to participants and registered um, colleagues um, after, the, after the event as well. So again, this will all be uh, available as a reference moving forward. And I just wanted to note that this is uh, this the presentation is heavily informed by this report. And so thank you so much to Sue and Olivia for your efforts in this regard. So let's go ahead and get started. So first, I thought it would be helpful before we get we get into discussions about how gender is integrated into the different aspects of the voluntary carbon market to first talk about what does it even mean to integrate gender into the carbon market and how could how, you know, in the best case scenario, how might that look? Um, and so first off, we have here different entry points that I've noted that again, have been drawn from, from the report I mentioned earlier. And I've organized these um, different entry points um, across, yeah, five different themes of which the report also does. And we have, um, I'm not going to go into detail on every single one, just in effort to try to stick on time. But one thing that you're going to notice is that these different groupings, um, there's, a, there's also trends. You see similar activities across these different areas as well. Um, so for example, under um, increasing VCM access to women, one of the key first activities is demystifying VCM for women's organizations and groups. And I, we hope through this workshop today that we are starting to on that process of it doing exactly just that. Um, and then also um, another key area is under this, this entry point theme is building capacity to women entrepreneurs and groups on the VCM, on a similar aspect. The VCM is a very complicated, um, yeah, uh, I would, yeah, I, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to say very complicated animal, one could say. So it's, it's, it's very, it's very key that all these actors that um, in order to make it um, equitable, also know what it means to be engaging with it. What does it mean? And where, where, you know, in, they're involved in projects, where does that fall? How can they, how can they get access? How can they also receive benefits? And this is a key issue that uh, Gabriella raised in her, her opening remarks. Um, these are all something to, to think about. Um, the next entry theme of entry points um, is integrating gender into the actual VCM standards and projects and initiatives. And that can involve a, a range of activities that we often see are often standard good practices and other climate finance related work as well. So into programming documents, uh, making sure you know women, men, and other stakeholder 
marginalized stakeholder groups are part of decision making processes. Um, it's clearly always, you know, doing awareness raising on gender and capacity building on gender as well. Um, and that sort of thing. Um, the next key entry point here would be creating demand for carbon credits that are actually looking um, that also yeah, address gender and women's empowerment principles, and they show achievement on gender and women's empowerment as well. So it's also demonstrating the business case of why gender is important in DCM and why someone or a company would want to buy a carbon credit that has, you know, proven results on promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. There needs to be an increase on the demand side of things, increased demand for that. And then finally, for um, you know, another key aspect is a, you know, a raising or increasing market awareness and resource and expertise on, on how to integrate and the, the, the business case for integrating gender in the VCM. And there's a lot of entry points for doing that. And this, we don't have to start from scratch on this either. There are proven um, good practices and lessons learned on that that we can generate through um, different climate finance work that's been going on. Um, and then clearly um, there is a key, key aspect in doing all of this also um, at the national level, um, making sure that different you know, work going on within governments on the VCM is ensuring that there's, you know, integration of um, women or gender focused organizations that could be in multi stakeholder platforms that could be in doing different capacity building and raising activities um, and other activities that are also noted here. So, and just to highlight most of this presentation moving forward will be focusing on this column here that I circled or yeah, with the red box. Um, again, this is also because this is such a diverse and complex field. And so we need to yeah, kind of focus this presentation, I think, um, and just kind of tackle it uh, bit by bit per se versus trying to take the whole um, entity all at once. So this said, we're gonna be looking right now at a couple different uh, carbon market standards, which Letizia did highlight in her presentation. And we're gonna be keeping that on a focus on the forex sector, um, just to kind of also focus in our discussion, because there's also very many, there's different types of carbon market standards out there that have a larger focus than just on um, forests. So that said, um, these different standards that I'm lifting here are specifically um, organized. It's a, it's a little bit of a qualitative assessment on, on my part, but in terms of where we're starting here with the gold standard, and um, I would definitely say that this is, has the strongest gender integration um, of the carbon standards that we will be discussing today. And I'll list that one first, and then we'll slowly kind of go down the scale of you know, less, 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 um, and where they stand in terms of actually integrating gender, if any, at all. So here, what's interesting with the gold standards is they have a gender policy, a very comprehensive gender policy, in fact, that applies just not to projects, but also to the secretariat, the board of directors, and different governance committees as well. And one of the items that they require of all of their projects is that it needs, to, all projects need to at least achieve um, a level of certification noted as gender sensitive. And projects, so all projects need to at least meet that minimum requirement. Um, and then projects, depending on how well they integrate gender and prove that in their, in their, in, in their application documents, um, can also get. Um, get a proactive gender responsive um, certification as well. And the way the key elements of being of getting at least a gender sensitive um, certification is I to make sure I look, I'm looking at my notes just to make sure I have this correct um, is to make sure that first that that within any kind of societal context that's discussed, that there is some aspects of gender related information that's conveyed within project design and within that analysis. Um, they also, the projects need to at least uh, comply with the safeguarding principles and requirement 
um, the one that's specifically noted on gender, which is principle two. And then they also need to ensure that um, when discussing their stakeholder consultation engagement efforts, um, they need to also include gender elements within that and they need to make sure certain gender elements were included um, in that process. So, and just to note, I'm just going to move to the next slide, but in the notes on this slide, I have links where you could go to get more information to get more details on how these two different levels of certification are applied by the gold standard. So the next um, standard we're going to be talking to plan about is Plan v Vivo. And they've also done, although I've noted here some gender integration, um, they've done not as much as gold standard, but they do have a pretty comprehensive integration of gender within their eligibility requirements. And I just noted some of them here. Again, I won't go too much into detail um, given the time, but what you do see here is that what's key and which I think many colleagues here know about is that it's really key to make sure that we're not just integrating gender into an analysis, any socioeconomic analysis, and also into the project document, but that we're, that is also being integrated into baseline requirements or indicators or some kind of uh, other aspects that make the projects accountable to the gender considerations that they're actually including and discussing. And that's, excuse me, that's what Plan Vivo is taking also a step beyond that I think the you know bare minimum to at least try to you know address those those issues. And I think that's a yeah, something to, um, yeah, this is great to see and something to, yeah, so maybe that another good practice that can be adopted by other standards moving forward. Okay, so, and then the next one here, we have Vera's um, Verified Carbon Standard. And that, um, again, Letizia did chat about this a little bit in her presentation as well. Um, and this is where a majority of Red Plus um, projects are, are, are taking, yeah, are involved in right now, about 90%, I think, Letizia, that was the, um, the percentage of projects. And so they have, they do have some gender requirements, um, and they do have a broad statement noting that within their, within their, um, <clears throat> Broad, yeah, statement on the importance of gender equality, but again, it's a broad statement. Um, within their safeguards requirements, they have a no net harm approach. Um, and within that, they, they ask that, um, yeah, that's in regards to environmental and socioeconomic impacts. There's not anything specific per se on gender within that statement. Um, but one can say it's still overall inclusive of gender aspects, but it's a bit implied. Um, and then communication and cons consultation is noted and that it's a requirement that it be done in a socially appropriate manner, um, including on language and gender sensitivity. Um, but what's key with, with VCS here is that it also has a partnership with WOCAN's W plus standard. Um, and some colleagues here might already know of this. Um, the standard is a, um, basically this, this partnership allows project developers to be able to apply for the W plus standard and they apply it to their VCS programs to then demonstrate contributions to women's empowerment and gender. Um, so then in turn, they can receive both verified carbon units from VCS which are jointly labeled under both standards. So that is, so they meet VCS and the W plus standard requirements for doing that. So in case colleagues here don't know what W plus standard is though, I thought I should highlight it. So um, it's a, I, I, I feel like this always, I think I'm just, this, this I, it, I think more, I think what BCS does with W+, I think if more carbon market standards were to do this, I think this would start to go a long way in addressing the, you know, some of the gaps that we're seeing in the, VC, in, in the VCM. It, but I understand there are issues and why yeah, everyone's still a bit 
I guess, hesitant because in terms of just the issue of addressing safeguards in the VCM is also just another layer of requirements. And then you tack on gender. Um, this is often the argument that is heard that how can we keep on with so many requirements the transaction cost of even being involved in the VCM gets so high, then it's like, you know, where, you know, where in the end is the value added for participating in the VCM. So with that, I guess, so with that, I guess, uh, disclaimer, I still feel like this is VC, the W plus standard is something that can really still be, um, yeah, I guess not exploited, but really ex explored more by different carbon standards to help improve their gender sensitivity or how genders, you know, then supported under them. So a bit of a background, it was created by WOCAN, um, and it's an independently verified qual quantitative methodology for assessing impacts and outcomes for women. And it can be in the W plus standard units can be monetized and traded um, just like carbon credits. And um, the key aspect of the W plus standard, which makes it quite unique is that um, it returns money to product developers, which also requires a minimum of 20% to be returned to local women's organizations. So if a product developer decides to want to, you know, undergo the process to get W plus standard units and credits, 20% um, of the proceeds that um, come from that need to go back to women to support women's organizations and women's empowerment, um, either within the project or the jurisdiction that is, uh, that, is that used it. So um, that's a, quite a unique thing. So it's putting them, yeah, the benefits back into the hands of women, which is great to see. Um, and it's designed to be implemented with, uh, with carbon and with non-carbon projects. Um, so in terms of the in terms of VERA and VCS, W plus um, can be used with that as demonstrated, um, but it can also be applied along other monitoring, reporting, and verification procedures of any VCM crediting program. And it includes the six different specific categories noted here on the bottom right-hand corner of my screen. Um, so you can measure different, um, yeah, different, cat different impact to women amongst these different categories. And you can pick and choose and select. You could do one, you could do all six, mix and match. So, um, and this is where, yeah, they focus their work. Okay, so just really briefly, um, this is, um, the next one we're going to cover is the Red Plus envi <clears throat> the Environmental Excellence Standard, which is developed by, by ART. And again, I really see that we're short on time because we want to have some time for group work with everyone here. So if colleagues are okay with it, I've listed briefly here um, some different uh, ways it, it integrates gender within its environmental, social, and governance guidance document. Um, it, there is a little bit there, but it's just, um, um, it's, it's quite brief, but it is there and it's a good, um, good starting point to maybe build up and build off for um, our trees in the future. And then lastly here, we just have two other items that I've grouped together because there is little to actually no gender integration into them. Um, one is the Climate Action Reserve, and the other is the American Carbon Registry. Um, and there's very little um, gender there, and often it's just implied in terms of larger social safeguards elements. So not much to actually discuss. So um, really briefly, I thought I would just cover here how gender is then integrated into the Carbon Integrity Initiatives that Letizia briefly covered at the end of her presentation. So firstly, um, I thought what we could cover here is the Integrity Council for the Involuntary Carbon Market. And again, this was based on um, the supply side, so the seller side. And for here, we see that um, uh, women are very well, they are well represented in the ICVCM um, Sorry, uh, governance structure, and we have different statistics available. 
And that's also um, in, the, in, the, in this presentation in the notes section, but it's also, I pulled this data from the report that I mentioned earlier at the beginning of my presentation, the integrating a gender lens into the voluntary carbon market. Um, and also um, recently, I think it was March of this year, um, the ICVCM developed their core carbon principles um, in which one criterion um, is on gender and it, it calls for these three different items um, that would need to happen, need to be required, uh, complied with um, for the, yeah, the mitigation activity at hand. So whatever that might be, it needs to meet these three requirements. And then lastly, and this will be the end of my presentation, um, on the buyer and demand side, we have the VCMI. And again, it's very nice to see that women are also well uh, represented in the current government structure of VCMI. Uh, I forgot that there's no I there, but um, it's supposed to say VCMI. And it, one of its 10 principles um, is equity-oriented um, action. Um, and it also highlights in its provisional claims code um, some basic considerations on gender that we often dis often see based on not, no, no discrimination on the basis of identity, gender, race, ethnicity, um, as well as um, the need to protect rights as related to gender, among others. 